Hello, I'm Mike Browning. Welcome to Let God Speak. The Bible is full of prophecies that have already been fulfilled. You think of the 300 plus prophecies that Jesus fulfilled in his life. These are classic examples of that. But what about the prophecies we are still waiting to see fulfilled? Waiting is the hard part. Today, we are going to study Adam and Eve's experience as they waited for the promised coming of the Saviour. Folks, on our panel today, we have Lena Yoon and we have Stephen Groom. And we really appreciate you folks coming along and being on our panel today. We'd like to pray together, so we invite everyone to join us. Father in heaven, it's a wonderful thing to be able to come and open the scripture together. We pray for your Holy Spirit to guide us today as we examine the experience of the first human family as they struggled with the problem of sin in their lives and waiting for their saviour. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Very good. We'd like to start today, folks, with looking at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, these are the words that God spoke to Lucifer, to Satan, um, as after Adam and Eve had sinned, and um, God was basically giving them the consequences, of or giving him the consequences of what he had done. And this is what God says to him. Verse 15 of chapter 3. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Um, now, Stephen, how important is this prophecy? Oh, it's very important. The subject there, he is obviously speaking about Satan. Um, but Adam and Eve had just yielded to Satan's temptation. They'd fallen into sin. And Paul says in, in Romans 7, 14, that their natures had changed. They'd gone under sin. Mm -hmm. But God is basically saying here that all is not lost. I see two promises here. Yes. God says that there's going to be enmity between Satan's group and the woman, which will be the church later. There would be a group of people that would oppose Satan in the end. Okay. And secondly, that there would be... Uh, a Messiah, this is a messianic prophecy, mm. who would, um, he would have his heel bruised. We know that Jesus, who was the Messiah, um, had the stakes taken, uh, put yeah. in his heels and yeah. also in his uh, wrists. Um, but ultimately, Jesus or the Messiah would uh, bruise his head. So okay. he would defeat okay. Satan. So he was to be a champ their champion, basically. There. Yeah. Um, what sort of deliverer, however, did Adam and Eve expect, Lena? Yeah, so even we read in Genesis 15, and we know that thy seed, uh, sorry, her seed, so basically means that uh, a human descendant of Eve yeah. would come to their rescue. So, um, you know, in other words, the Son of God will join Adam and Eve's family, which is very crucial. Mm -hmm. But they didn't have that crucial last detail right. about the Son of God coming and joining the human family. But it was so important that the human family was to be the place where he would appear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, would they have expected, and this is the point, would they have expected one of their own children to be this deliverer? Because, you know, it was clear it was her seed. Um, obviously, because they had no idea of the time delay. And I'd like to read um, Genesis 4, verse 1. It says, Now Adam knew his wife, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, I'd just like to say your Bible uh, probably says a man from the Lord, but that word from is included in the English, in the Hebrew. And I'd like to say it says, I have acquired a man, the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that Lord is the tetragrammaton, which is uh, Yahweh. So they thought that the man child, the first one who was Cain, was the Lord. They were to be, um, and, and they, the Cain comes from the Hebrew word kenna, which means to acquire, which means that they thought they acquired something precious. They thought he was the Messiah. Yes. Um, how bitterly disappointed they would be. Okay, okay. 
they were to be bitterly disappointed, weren't they? Okay, so, um, all right, they went on with their lives and they had a second son. And what did she say after the birth of the second son, that is Eve? Yeah. yeah, so uh, in uh, verse 2, actually nothing of significant is recorded here, though. We know that, you know, that, uh, the meaning of or the word for Hebrew for uh, Abel is Hebel, so which means, you know, vapor or breath. Um, so, but other than just mentioning their, you know, occupation, Abel's um, occupation and Cain's, and nothing is really um, significant uh, is recorded here. Okay, so, that's interesting. So the focus was clearly on Cain. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting and probably not too good for Cain either, by the way, as it turns out. He was probably spoilt, do you think? I think he probably was. Yes. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say he was. Um, and um, unfortunately, it didn't help him at all um, mm. in that. Okay, so the boys grow up and uh, events transpired that revealed their very different characters these boys had. And... Um, as I said, Cain was obviously the golden-haired boy, and I'm sure this went to his head in more ways than one. Um, Stephen, what did these boys do with their lives then? Cain was a farmer producing fruit and vegetables. He was obviously um, not hard, not, um, he, he was not afraid of doing hard work. Okay. However, Abel was a, a keeper or protector of sheep. He was a shepherd, um, and this is in Genesis 4, verse 2. Yep. Um, he was a more gentle soul. And, and obviously the, the father, Adam, preferred Cain and, and Eve preferred the company of um, Abel. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, now, time went by and one day the boys come to worship before the Lord. And this is where the story gets very interesting and very important. Uh, so can you describe for us what happened, Lena, when they came to worship God? Yeah, so if you read Genesis 4, 3, uh, verses from, uh, 3 to 5, we can actually see, you know, um, so, and in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of that, the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and, Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So basically, Cain brings... Um, you know, a thank offering, the best produces from his garden, you know, meaning um, the result of his own hard work. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Abel brings a sacrifice, right? So there's a striking uh, difference. Actually, Abel's sacrifice signifies an act of faith in the deliverer who would come to yeah. um, rescue them from their sins. So, which is very significant. So we can see this striking contrast between working off our sins Hmm. and an act of faith in the deliverer from sin. Yeah, yes. No, it's, um, Cain just did not get it. But there's actually more to this, I think, than meets the eye. Um, what did Cain think of the whole notion of offering sacrifice? Well, well clearly he didn't like it because, and rejected it because hmm. his offering showed that he ignored the requirements of God. He brought the, the fruit of, of his own uh, works. And here we have, I believe the two types of um, sacrifices that worshippers bring to God. They either bring their own fruits yeah. or they do God's requirements. Okay, and if, and if he still and the family still holding on to the idea of him being the deliverer, yes. do you suppose that he thought that perhaps it was he then who was symbolised by the sacrifice and he wasn't having anything to do with that? Um, I'm just wondering what was going on through Cain's mind. That's line. an interesting thought. Mm. Maybe he didn't want to lay himself on the altar. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't think he did. Um, anyhow, Cain was ignoring something very important here, Lena. Yep. Wasn't he actually? Uh, basically, he was ignoring the plain command of God to perform okay. a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, you know, that's really uh, significant because an act of faith in the deliverer coming sacrificial death of the Redeemer to come, yeah. which is really, really important, but yeah. he obviously ignored it. Yeah, and God had, as you said, God had commanded, and that yeah. was what he should have done. Okay, thank you for that. Um, moving on to Abel for a moment here, Stephen, what, what was the outstanding feature of Abel's life? What, stood, what stands out in Scripture about him? Well, this is brought out in, in Paul's writing later. If we go to Hebrews chapter 11 and yes. verse 4, it says, 
by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Yeah. And, and what usually happens on the offering, they offered it probably on an altar of some sort. When it was accepted by God, usually fire would come down from God out of heaven and consume the offering. Mm. And obviously this didn't happen with, with Cain's offering. Yeah, for the veggies. Yeah. Nothing wrong with the veggies. It was the point, it was the point that he was making. Yeah. Um, when he made his thank offering and not a sacrifice. OK, we've got the point there. Um, it just as a matter of uh, um, incidentally, incidental thought here, Lena, how well did they understand the, fasc- the sacrificial system, which was greatly expanded in the time of Israel, of course, but mm-hmm. how much did they know about it? Yeah, so uh, if we look at um, Genesis 4 and 4, and, you know, and Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So the fat, you know, um, we can see that, um, you know, it was mentioned, not really in a great detail, though. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we can see still that they knew the first family, right, knew about what it means. Because, you know, when God gave Israelites instructions regarding mm-hmm. the sacrificial system, the fat was to be removed from the animal mm-hmm. and burnt on the altar, right, mm-hmm. as a special offering. So the, they the, must have had some sort of idea. This represented sin, didn't it? Mm. The yeah. fat represents sin. That's why it was cut removed off. Removed from the, from the body, yeah. Good yeah. thought. So the sacrificial system all had representation and Mm. and deep meaning to it, Mm. didn't it? Yes, and so they obviously knew more than is actually listed for us there in Genesis. That's the point. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had much more detail than we might think Mm. that they had at that time. Um, I'd like to move on to Genesis, still Genesis chapter 4, folks. And now verse 5. Did we read verse 4? I think you did there, um, Lena. Yeah. How the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but not Cain's. Um, Verse 5 says he did not respect Cain and his offering and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. Um, And it goes on to say in verse 6, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Uh, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Quite a warning. And its desire is for you, but you should have, sorry, you should rule over it. Um, why was he so angry? Why was Cain so angry about this? Obviously, because he he was his offering was not accepted, so he felt uh, how would you call it um, put off and, and mm. inferior to Abel, who's unjustly offering treated. Accepted, unjustly treated, mm. and so um, I, I think the key words it, and we see in verse six, God, the Lord's um, gentle persuasion to try and have Cain repent and mm. do what is right. He says, if you do well, will you not be accepted? In okay. other words, you know, if you do what you're asked to do, y- mm. you'll be accepted just like yeah. Abel is. But he's not accepted, and that's why he's angry. Okay. And so with this anger, he, he has a, a, dis- a hatred towards God and also Abel, his brother, whom he ends up killing. So he's angry with them both, with both he's God both. and Abel, yeah. Because he, he feels like he hasn't been justly treated, as you and said. And he's jealous of Abel. No, that's really interesting, isn't it? Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, Lena, what do you think of the way God actually spoke to Cain about this in verse 7 there, where it says he, he, he talks about sin lying at the door. Its desire is to have you, but you should rule over. What do you think about God's approach there? Well, although um, Cain was angry at God, but God's approach was very um, kind and compassionate. Mm. So at least to Cain to look to himself honestly, but um, it, again, it was not just, you know, a kind approach, but at the same time, a warning. Yes. Right. So. Mm. And, and I feel that um, the, the promises in Genesis 3.15, you know, God is emphasizing that, hey, if you want to fight this rebellion in you, you know, mm. I will help you through this. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But apparently Cain didn't want to mm. fight the rebellion, if you like. Um, there were some things that Cain needed to learn and to know. Stephen weren't there. Yes. Uh, God knows what he's doing. You know, mm. um, his commands are not optional. Uh, Cain's acceptance with God must be on his terms. You know, all through the Bible, 
and, and including the Old Testament, yeah. is a, an appeal to God's people, you know, keep his commandments, do what is right, and you'll be accepted, you know. We're fighting a... a Faithfulness. We're, we're, yeah. we're fighting a battle here mm. between disobedience, which we love to do, and the Lord's way, which will give us eternal life in the end. And yeah. Cain was no different. Cain and Abel were no different than we are today. Mm. Okay, yeah. so they had the same struggles. Fair enough, yes. Um, what specifically did he say God, God say he must actually do? Cain, Cain had some clear instructions personally given to him, didn't he? Lena? Yes, yes. So basically, uh, God told Cain that the problem was in himself, no one to blame but himself. Yeah. Yeah, so that was the whole point of it. And God calls Cain to be also more proactive about his uh, defiant and rebellious attitude. So as you mentioned, you know, you should rule over it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So he was, God was wanting to know how serious it was. And, and, and because of this, having. because of the fall of mankind, it's only through this vital connection with, with the Saviour, Jesus, uh, which Abel sought for mm. and, and obedience, that we can overcome this nature. But Cain didn't s see the need to do this, no. obviously. No, he didn't. Um, there's, uh, there's an interesting insight into the gift of free will that God has given us here, Stephen. Don't you think? Oh, it's absolutely amazing. You know, mm -hmm. God doesn't, the omnipotent God who, who can build universes and create mm -hmm. them in the snap of a finger or, or through his voice does not force us to do anything. He, he appeals to us. He shows us the right way to go, but he will not force us to do it. To do it. Um, he does everything to persuade us. Mm. But he will not force us, and I find that no, amazing. No, and and we have the, he gives us the privilege of making our own decisions about things. Yeah. Yes, we wear the consequences, of course, yes. of what we do and choose to do. But the choice is ours. Yes, mm. and and the same with us today. The Bible makes it clear where the path of disobedience leads, and where the path of the, the path of obedience leads mm. to eternal mm. life, mm. and leaves it up to us to choose yeah. which way we will go. Choose you this and, day, and, and we can see that clearly in uh, Cain and Abel. He, he yeah. showed them clearly what would happen in yeah. the paths they would take. Yeah, no, that's good. That's very true. Um, well, going back to Cain again, did God's kind counsel help Cain at all? Well, not at all. Um, you know, we read our verse 8, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So uh, sin does this and, you know, people indulge in it and, you know, it's, you know they just, sin gets worse and worse. Um, you know, from the uh, sin of Adam and Eve, it just took only two generations mm. you know, to get to the point of murdering, you know. It's so, incredible, isn't it? Yeah. The first, the first two human born yeah. became a murderer. No, it's a great concern, all right. And, um, and it was a very serious matter. Um, reading on from where you were, you read verse 8 in chapter 4. There. I'm going to read verse 9, yep. which says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Not that God didn't know, but he was wanting mm. Cain to come up with it. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? A famous saying. And he said, that's God said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me, from the ground. What a sad lament. Um, Steve, so you compare um, the response of Adam when God confronted him about his sin with the response of Cain here. Yes. Quite different, isn't it? Adam, um, while he looked for someone to blame, he blamed it on his wife Eve, who blamed it on, on the snake for, mm. for temptation. He didn't hide or uh, try to cover up his sin. No. He took the blame for it in mm. some way. However, Cain, by contrast, what he openly defies God, but he also lied. I see here where he says, you know, am I my brother's keeper? In other words, he's basically lying. Yeah, I as don't if, know he yeah. says where he is, but yeah. of course he as, if, as if God didn't mm. know, you know, mm. but then God had to reveal uh, to him. And, and it's only when God told him his punishment for what he had done that he changes his attitude when he hears the consequences of his crime. Mm. And um, we look at Genesis 4, verse, verses 11 to 13. It says, Now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. 
Mm. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive, fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. I mean, this is a terrible curse. Remember, this is the first murder on the earth. Nowadays, I suppose in this generation, mm. it's almost become commonplace. Mm. But um, this was a terrible crime in this time. Mm. Mm. He goes on to say, when you till the ground in verse 12, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. Mm. Yes. A fugitive and a vagabond you shall be in the earth. Um, this, this is more a statement, I think, of, of the, cho the choices he would make as opposed to what God would make him do. Mm. Yeah. Um, do, do you think it's more of a blessing also in that um, man would have to work harder now to get the uh, vegetable, the fruit? From, yes, from yes. Yeah, I'm sure it's definitely. the case. Definitely. Then yeah. that leads to, you know, leads people to, you know, come back to God. Yeah. You know, so. Hard work never hurt anybody. <laughs> I mightn't like it, but it's out there. All right. Well, if you're a keen gardener, you know what this, what the, this is true. You know, I'm a keen gardener. I go out there and check how much the moths have eaten and this sort of thing yeah. every day. It just goes on. Um, and that's the way life is. We yeah. do have our struggles today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read on a bit further. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 14. Well, 13 and 14, Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Mm. Um, it was pretty serious stuff, you've got to admit. Um, and then verse 14, surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth and it will happen. Anyone who finds me will kill me. Um, Lena, the, you know, what are the significance of some of these words? For example, I shall be hidden from your face. What is he saying here? Basically, he fears for his life, you know, if God is not with him. So, uh, therefore, God puts uh, you know, some sort of mark on him. We read, um, you know, verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayed Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but unfortunately, you know, um, although God protected Cain, right, but we read uh, verse 16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So basically, he went out from the presence of the Lord and basically means he left. He never returned to the Lord. Yeah. That's the sad part of it. Yep, he was satisfied with the mark of protection and uh, that's yes. it then. Yes. And he was gone. That was really sad, wasn't it? So, so what do you think of the, may I ask, the, this curse that was on Cain, that everyone who sees him will kill him? Is mm. that some sort of natural retribution? You know, the Bible says whatever measure you meet to you, it will be measured again because he kills someone. People would yeah, be Yeah, he to probably kill him. understood that. But in, in addition to that, he, he was, even though he didn't particularly value the presence of God, he knew it was his protection. Mm. And he knew that he was being put, sent off. And I think he was just plain afraid of not having God with him. So God gives him the mark, and then he's happy to go off and leave God behind. Just took advantage of it. He did, basically. yep. So he was gone, which is really, really sad. Um, now the influence of his life, we all know that we have an influence, whether good or evil, all of us have an influence on other people, whether we like it or not, or realize it or not for that matter. What was Cain's influence on the world um, from that point on, Stephen? Yes, well then we have two lines of people we have the sons of God through Seth, which is a later child, mm. and we have the the sons of uh, what was it? Sons of mm. sons of men. And. Sons of sons men, of men yeah. which comes from Cain's line. Yeah. And I'd just like to read in verse seventeen and nineteen. It says, "And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of, of the city after the name of his son Enoch." Verse nineteen. It says. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the second was Zillah. So here we have the first account in the Bible of polygamy, yeah. you know, double marriage. So we have um, adultery being recorded here. Yeah. And later he says, I have killed a man to my own hurt or... For hurting me. It's for hurting me, yes. Translation. In, in yeah. some, so... He boasts of killing a man. So here we clearly see that um, he's inherited this ungodly yeah. nature from his father yeah. and um, he's 
committed murder and, and now gotten worse, polygamy. Yep. yep. Um, and so he wasn't a very nice character. So this was the legacy of Cain. That's what we are saying here. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're going to have to move on pretty quickly now. Mm -hmm. um, Adam and Eve had another son after the loss of Cain and Abel and that tragedy. Uh, chapter 4, verse 25, it says, Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Those are the words of Eve, obviously. Um, how important was this, this particular birth of um, Lena, of Seth? Yeah, this was so important because the deliverer, you know, has to come through the line of Adam and Eve, mm. right? But, you know, because of this double tragedy, it looked like, you know, there was no hope. But, uh, and, you, know, you know, fortunately, God actually provided um, an alternative. So, uh, you know, another son here, you know, which means... Um, Seth. So Seth um, begins a line of faithful, godly uh, men, yeah. also known as uh, the sons of uh, God, mm. but in contrast with Cain's descendants, you know, known mm. as the uh, yeah. sons of men. So, yeah, and I notice in verse 26 of chapter 4, as for Seth, to him also a son was born. He named him Enoch. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. It's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. So. Um, a beautiful picture of why, what you just said, of how they began to call on God's name. Um, so you've got the sons of God and the sons of men now existing, men of faith and men without faith. And very quickly, Stephen, did these two groups um, go their separate ways from now on then? Unfortunately, they didn't. Uh, the sons of, of God began to marry with the daughters of men. And I'll read that in Genesis 6, verses one to three. Mm. Now it came to pass when the men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years old. Okay. So clearly this amalgamation brought them in disfavor with God yeah. and they followed the daughters of men and the and ungodly they lost their line. faith. And, yes. uh, and the line of godly men got smaller and smaller, but didn't fully die out. No. Um, and in the end, there was only one family, Noah and his family, who yeah. came from Seth's. Praise life. God, there were those. Well, folks, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, the sons of God are still called to remain a group quite distinct from the sons of men today. It's our privilege to walk with God like those early believers. Um, it's also our privilege to encourage the sons of men to seek the God of salvation also. Mm. Well, folks, we're glad you joined us today on Let God Speak. Remember, remember all our past programs plus teacher's notes are available on our website, 3abnaustralia.org.au. You can email us if you would like to do so. And uh, we invite you to join with us again next time. God bless. You have been listening to Let God Speak, a production of 3ABN Australia Television. To catch up on past programs, please visit 3abnaustralia.org.au. Call us in Australia on 02 4973 3456 or email radio at 3abnaustralia.org.au. We'd love to hear from you.